Thank you for listening to Chart Your Fi. I'm your host, Chris Elder. And today on Chart Your Fi, we have evolved into an interview podcast that talks about goal planning, overcoming the odds, financial independence, and how it's not the end goal, but a means to find your purpose in life. And we talk about the not so common, common sense things in life. Stand by for the sound of freedom. Before we get to the Chart Your Fi episode, I just wanted to do a quick shout out about Return to Roots podcast. It's about retention in the military, transition from the military, and reintegration into the community. This podcast is not just for the service member, but for the family unit as well. Also, anyone that wants to put action to their thank you for service can find more information on this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and many other social media networks. Thank you. And listen to the Chart Your Fi episode now. Today we're honored to be able to speak with David Pierre. David is the CEO of Military to Millionaire and also Marine veteran, author, podcaster, public speaker, and so many more things. It's a privilege to be able to have him on the show, and I hope you guys enjoy it. After kind of hearing a little bit about my story, um, like, uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your story and how you got to, uh, getting to where you're at today. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I did a lot of the same mistakes that every other service member makes, right. I, I joined in 08. Uh, I grew up in Arkansas, not poor, but not well off, you know, homeschooled kid, religious background. Parents were kind of marriage counselor, missionary mix. So we, we grew up on support. So, you know, they raised money from people. And if people donated, then we ate. And if not, then we tried to raise more. Uh, so not a, not ever like really well off, you know, a lot of, a lot of equate brand or whatever non-name brand stuff growing up. Uh, and coming up towards the end of high school was like, I don't like school. Uh, I don't have really have money for school i've never been good at school i don't have scholarships um, i like sports but i'm not really good enough to play at a collegiate level at least not at a scholarship level to justify how bad i am at, uh, academically and i don't want to stay in arkansas so not a whole lot of options here because i can't afford out-of-state tuition without these scholarships that i'm not getting and i don't really want to go to school anyway and i want to leave so you know, one day you're sitting in the high school, the one semester I went to public school, and these guys show up in dress blues, and you're like, oh, wow, those guys look cool. And you start talking to them, and you're like, wow, they, they travel a lot. That sounds cool. I can leave Arkansas in the military. And I talked to all the different recruiters and just kept coming back to the Marine Corps. So I joined the Marine Corps, travel the world, big adventure, you know, and I loved it. Uh, that first seven years, you know, I didn't necessarily make any major mistakes. I just, I don't really have regrets. I just, you know, I even, I was contributing to the TSP. I put eight to 10% in on average, but I just left it all in the G fund. I didn't know, you know, anything, you know, it's like, man, if I'd, I'd have triple what I do in there right now, if I had just known to change which fund it went into, right. It's like the simplest thing in the world. If someone had told me that. And so I was doing, you know, kind of the basic same simple right things but then i was also blowing all my money on booze and tattoos and dates and sports cars and harleys and you know kintown out in okinawa and and you know whatever else um all the normal marine corps things go to afghanistan come back buy a truck and a sniper rifle and a bunch of other stupid things and uh the harley and end up on recruiting duty one day and wake up and go hey I work really long hours and it kind of sucks and I can't quit because I don't have any money to do anything else. So yeah, someone kind of tried to get me into Amway, handed me the book, rich dad, poor dad. And I was like, ah, I don't read Meh. And he's like, I have it on a CD. You drive a lot, put it in your CD player and, you know, listen to it. And in my government Chevy Malibu, I, it's like, oh, fine, he got me. So I put it in the CD player and listened to it driving to school. And school's like 
you know, to h- h- recruit. And that was all she wrote. I mean, I listened to that book and I was like, oh, all right, this book's cool. Passive income sounds cool. What other books are out there? I started listening to more Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, you know, purple library books, and then started listening to some Bigger Pockets books and then researching more books and then stumbled into more about real estate. And then probably within four months, I bought a duplex. I lived in one half and I rented the other. And uh, that, I mean, that was proof of concept. I got stationed in Hawaii. That thing started paying me only a couple, you know, a hundred bucks a month, maybe. And I was like, Ooh, this works. And then it was like, I'm going to keep buying real estate. And, uh, so I bought that first one, December 28th of 2015 and October 10th, 2021. So, you know, whatever that math is just under seven years or just under six years. Uh, you know, that first one, I was probably maybe not a negative net worth by the time I closed on the duplex, but pretty close to zero. Uh, I had been a negative net worth when I read the book, but I mean, it was like right around zero. And uh, a six year mark later, uh, technically like million dollar net worth on paper, but who cares? More importantly, I was able to walk off active duty and not only not take a job, but hire a full-time W-2 employee as an executive assistant to take over a lot of stuff I was doing on the side and haven't had to fire her yet or, you know, take a W-2 myself. So, um, it's been good. Um, been a lot of ups and downs. Uh, learned a lot of hard lessons. Thrown a lot of money at stupid things. But for the most part, uh, yeah, been a wild journey. Bought a bunch of real estate. Sold some real estate. That's the the long story short. And I'm sure we'll dig into some other stuff there. I mean, lots of different kinds of transactions along the way. So. Yeah, um, man, it's funny you mentioned the Amway thing, man. <clears throat> They were super predatory around like the 2008, was it 2008, 2000, or was it like 2011 over there in would be on Washington. They were super, super predatory. They were, <clears throat> I remember they were like, oh man, hey, come to Starbucks, man. We'll hang out. We'll talk about this and that. And yeah, I, man, those Amway scams, they were like everywhere. Um and a good point is that there's there's a lot of scams out there. <laughs> always, there's always people trying to figure out ways to get get rich off of um, other people's wants and desires to get immediate wealth. And yep. the immediate wealth doesn't just does not just happen, you know. And time and time, you know, uh, could be proven right. You know, house hacking is how I started too. I didn't know what it was called. I just kind of bought a house in 2007. <laughs> then held on to it barely, you know, through 2008. Love it. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't know it was called house hacking to buy a house, live in the smaller portion of it, rent out the rest of it. You know, I, I didn't yeah. know it's, that's what it was called. Um, and I, I it probably wasn't that. then. Yeah, it was <laughs> People uh, probably just like, eh. yeah, it's like, well, the only way I can afford it is if I rent out the bigger house and I live in the small house. And yeah, that's kind of how I ended up with my first property, Um, which, you know, it it doesn't pay huge, but, you know, it, it paid something at the, at the beginning, you know, Um and especially during the market crash, you know, we held on to it. Um, I got, you know, a couple of things worked out in our, our uh, benefit is, you know, Sarah was going to college and I ended up going to Cuba and that's how we held, held on to it for so long. But, you know, uh, we put a lot of uh, what we call sweat equity, which we were calling yep. the sweat e- equity before that was even really coined. Uh, <laughs> we, we'd be like, oh man, we're putting all this freaking backbreaking work into this place um and then one day i was like ah oh, sweat equity but apparently i guess it's a coined phrase now but um they just didn't record me saying it back then <laughs> there you go that's funny yeah yeah I, I love the house hacking thing i mean and you said you know you're not making a ton of money off it necessarily but you know where the real money is made with house hacking is the fact that like you've got to pay to live somewhere and when you house hack even if you are still paying out of pocket a little bit the amount that you're paying out of pocket is 
always unless you unless you really mess something up and buy something that you absolutely should not have messed with right you're like well i could have lived in a studio apartment because i'm single but instead i'm going to buy a mcmansion and call it a house hack and then nobody's going to want to live in it because uh i I don't know. Homeless people are also in it. And, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. Like as long as you buy a somewhat reasonable property, um, you know, you're going to basically, even if you break even or are paying a little bit, you've replaced 70, 80, 90, hundred percent of what you would have been paying in rent. So even me, I, I had a, a house hack, I call it uh, in San Diego where I didn't buy a house because I was only going to be there for like a year, year and a half. And, the limits for the VA loan were still in a weird spot where they were existent at this, that, and the other when I first got there. And um, so I rented. I was like, hey, can I rent this for a year or two during uh, this time? And um, is that, you know, regardless, like 70, 80, 90, 100% of what you would have been paying to rent or live somewhere, you, know, you would have been paying. So, like my uh, like San Diego house hack example, um, with the way the market was and, and the limit still existing on the VA loan, which ironically got taken away like six months after I moved there. Uh, I wasn't able to buy a house hack because I was only going to be there for so long. And if I'd known that limit was going to disappear, I totally wouldn't have done this. I would have waited and bought, but you know, hindsight 2020, I didn't know that at the time. Um, so anyway, so I, I signed a two year lease. I was like, Hey, this place looks great. Uh, I know you want a one year at this price. I'll sign a two year at the same price if you'll agree to let me sublet rooms on Airbnb, whatever my family's out of town. And they were like, okay, they put it in the lease. I just didn't mention that my family was going to be out of town the majority of the time. And, you know, whatever, no harm, no foul, right? I mean, they were cool with it. So why would it matter if it was once a month or every month, whatever? Um, and uh, so I had a four bedroom, three bath that I Airbnb'd two of the bedrooms out for the two years that I was there. And my rent was 3000. I brought in about 2,500 through the Airbnbs nice. and it, um, yeah, so it worked out. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a, like an absolute win right there. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, Hey, look, you gotta, you gotta make a sacrifice in order to make that happen too um you had to essentially get a house furnish the house then go out there and put your stuff on there and you know it's not just like it, it was instantaneously you had to put a lot of work in there um and that's what a lot of people don't understand you know hey it takes a lot of work and a lot of direction of your energy so like if you're gonna do this you have to like actually like we're going to do it like it's got to be like a, a commitment, uh, a commitment of your time, commitment of resources. You're going to be committing, committing things to it. And that's where a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't know about that. And I'm like, well, until you get to the point where you can commit time, money, uh, like you should be ensuring that your TSP is fully funded in the right fund, you know, uh, the G fund thing, man, that thing hit me like, uh, like, yep, yep. I'm embarrassed. Everybody. That Everybody, me, you know. It took me so long, so long to finally figure that out. And you're right, man. I could have had way more if I knew the power of my TSP. I knew about yep. it, but the education on it is just not where it should be at. No, absolutely not. No. Yeah, it's, you know, and I've done a lot of articles and and stuff trying to you know get that all sorted out at this point and help people out with it and uh, posted a lot of things and i uh, still definitely misunderstood a lot of that stuff is now luckily you know the dod now with the new with the blended retirement anyone who joins now it doesn't go into the g fund right it goes into the the life cycle fund that correlates with the year they retire or closely and you know Life cycles still probably not the best option for a lot of people, right? Uh, especially like a young, you know, at 18, I'm like, pff, go as aggressive as humanly possible for almost everybody. But it's a heck of a lot better than the G Fund, 
right? So, you know, and I understand that the government can't make a specific recommendation because so they're like, we either got to go like G fund or life cycle because they don't want people coming after me if, you know, well, the market I'm glad, and... I'm glad they changed it to the life cycle fund because the G fund thing, my goodness, it's like your money's literally eroding in a bank account. Um, uh, because it's only gain. It was, you know, normal without a weird uh, market, but you know, Hey, we get them every 15, 20 years or something like that. Get a weird market. Uh, the G fund sits at like just a little bit over 1%, you know, <laughs> your, your, uh, your cost of living increases is usually 2.1 or 2. Point something. So your money yeah, G usually hovers balance is right around inflation or yeah, yeah so yeah yeah it's it's not much it's not yeah it's it's not your money's not doing nothing uh, you know yeah. if you were to if you were to log into tsp.gov and look at the 10-year averages for all the funds and you're like hmm which one's the highest and you're young you should probably look at the 10-year average you know, and that's why I tell people, I'm like, hey, I can tell you what the 10-year average is, you know, it's the C fund and S fund are going to look the best, you know, but you should open up the TSP fund. They actually have a calculator and that shows you like 10-year average. Everybody's like, oh, well, I, sh I should be moving around. I'm like, hey, unless you're like, unless you're dedicating your time to managing your TSP all the time, not, don't move it around unless you, like that's like your thing. That's oh yeah, my hobby is to move my TSP around. I'm in it, every, you know, two times a day, and, mm. and then Gosh. like even then, that's like like you're gonna lose money at first doing that stuff, and you you can't. Why would you pl why would you play with your lifeboat like that? <laughs> that Facebook group. What is I can't even there's a oh. Facebook group. I can't think of her name, Beth something or something. I know what something. you're talking about. Yeah. They won't, they won't let me in. Uh, somebody even somebody even took like a piece of my book that basically said that the where I talked about that the life cycle, like the the that it defaulting to life cycle was better than G fund. And like I'm glad that it did that. And they took that and they were like, This whole book is trash, you know, and I'm like well, you took it out of context because if you read yeah. the rest of the book, you would know that that's not my personal allocation and that I don't personally think that that is the best allocation. However, it is better than G fund and it is yeah. better for somebody who doesn't take the time. I basically, what I tell people is like either do the life cycle or take the time and read this resource or this resource to learn and decide based on your own risk tolerance and your own goals what fits your investing style and then ex execute. For me, I'm 75% C, 25% S. At one point I was 70 C, 30 S and 10 I or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I'll get more conservative with age. But they they made the post and they tagged me or and they commented and someone tried to share it to me and all this stuff. And then I requested to join and I was like, Hey, you know, just trying to, that won't let me into the group. So I made an entire YouTube video about that section and about the group and about day trading your TSP and they won't let me in and they, they wouldn't even respond to it. And it's like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you can day trade and seasonal trade your TSP. And I'm sure there's some math there, but like, you know, they just, they just omit, the the damage that is caused by fees and yeah. by trying to time the market right like you have to be right both times you have to be right when you exit you have to be right when you enter exactly. and then you you have to also be right enough that the amount that you're right outweighs the cost of the fee of both transactions and still comes out on top of what would have happened if you just left it alone and yeah. so it's like you know, professional traders very rarely are able to do that consistently over long periods of time. So it's for me, it's could you do it theoretically? Yes. Is it worth the amount of time and energy that it takes to be that involved in your TSP and or market to maybe be able to pull it off? Absolutely not. There are much more passive investments that do a much more consistent job of outperforming the market. No, thanks. Sign me up for a syndication, buddy. I'm out. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, and it's, you know, obviously everything uh as a personal preference you got to figure out what's what's best for you what what makes the most sense for for you know for you what makes the most sense for me and that's that's what you dive into you know hey uh the airbnb thing man um kudos to you for figuring that out um that that's that took a lot of work to figure that that stuff out but uh but you did it and and you prevented yourself from incurring a large cost while living in san diego um, and you know, Hey, you know, my, my little house hack was I volunteered to be, <laughs> be a resident advisor in a barracks, you know, and my penance is that I do barracks inspections and that I, um, pretty much take up any kind of matters that deal with like, Hey, any kind of living situation for the, for the, uh, sailors that are, that live here, which is perfectly fine with me. Um, yeah. you know, uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of people would be like, oh, man, I couldn't do it. But it's like, hey, so the, the barracks I live in is called Weber Hall. Uh, Weber Hall, uh, he he passed away. He's a Medal of Honor recipient. He's in the, He was a, a Marine. Uh, a lot of people didn't even know what Weber Hall or who Weber Hall was until I came here and I started talking about the history of the building. Like, it used to be a Marine barracks. You know, hey, let's have a little context about where we live and why it's like that, you know, like, and Hey, let's take a little bit of pride in our, and what we have and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, not just halfway doing something, but if you're going to do it, you got to commit, commit to it, you know, no matter if it's, you know, uh, Airbnb uh, or being a resident advisor, you know, Hey, it's literally, it saves me money to live here. Uh, and you were saving money by doing that. So that way you can divert your um, your funds to making you uh, a good fund for later on, you know? Yep, absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure the barracks runs a lot smoother with a senior chief in charge than it would with a, you know, petty officer third class. <laughs> the, the sailors are probably like, oh, yeah, we're going to actually listen. Yeah, they uh, definitely it's changed a lot in the last couple months that I've been here. So, um, <laughs> but but that's that's the thing. It's like, hey, it's no matter. And like, I don't, uh, um, you know, I, I don't get any kudos for the things I do here. Um, but it's like, it, it's no matter what you're doing, whatever your craft is, you got to like take a little bit of time. You know, whether you're a day trader, whether you're um, you work as um a restaurant um a server in a restaurant or if you if you're a handyman uh working as a plumber or electrician you know whatever you're doing you'll know, be good at your craft um and have and have the right uh mindset towards being not only good at your craft but being pleasant to be around and i'm not saying like you have to be like freaking unicorns or rainbows I, i'm a sailor i curse i i hold people accountable <laughs> um you know there's some days i'm you know grumpy some days i get really passionate about things you know like hey shitmate why is your haircut suck you know or hey shitmate why is your room a wreck or hey get your freaking hands out of your pockets you know i know marines you guys have your hands in your pockets but hey <laughs> <laughs> but but you know it's like hey it's it's like taking that little bit of effort and getting into that and um bro the house hacking thing, man, it's just worked for me, man. And that's how we've worked our way into seven doors now. You know, um, I'm not huge by any means. I know there's plenty of people that um, are doing hundreds, hundreds of doors. But hey, you know, you just got to find what works for you and just, you know, and, um, you know, scale as big as you want to scale. Yep, I agree completely. Yeah, man, you definitely don't need to get wrapped up in the numbers and scale scale uh there's something to be said for keeping it simple and lucrative without having to go overboard <laughs> yeah yeah like we we thought about uh going uh crazy but we're like hey what if we just kind of focus on becoming debt free and those and those things that we have and literally we just have a set income for life you know what i'm saying like 
if you can figure out ways to do that and set yourself up so that way your passive income takes over your active income and then you're just sitting there going wow what am i going to do like am i going to like pick up golfing probably not i'm probably going to get back into three gun competition and you know do things that do things that i want to do like more podcasting and um taking you know long walks on the beach yeah there you go you are in san diego i mean the place to do it right yeah it really is man um speaking of before i before i forget yeah uh you you should write yourself up for an msm at retirement and not mention your actual job just the barracks job that would be awesome it should be like you know during during my time here barrack occupancy went from this to this and and room inspection passing rate went from would be the funniest thing ever on your way out you're like i, I just want an msm for the barracks that's it i'm gonna slide walks on takes long walks walks on beaches too <laughs> there you go police called the beach yeah <laughs> Anyone listening, I'm sure everyone listening knows what that is, but Meritorious Service Medal, it's uh, fairly fairly high on the food chain and, and usually an award that you don't receive until like very towards the end of your tour as yeah. a, you know, retirement type. Yeah. And, and the, the joke about writing your own award, well, an absolute joke is also something that happens in the military, not speaking from experience, because I definitely have not written two of my personal awards when leaving units of the four so <laughs> i have written myself a com and a nam both directed hey you want this here's a template write your own cool thanks got it <laughs> you know uh, man that that's always driven me nuts i, I always make myself write other people's um <laughs> but yeah it's funny but like having to write your own award, man, that's like, I make them write their own evals. Like, yeah, I'm guilty of that. Yeah. I want to see what they I think. Got, I mean, I got to put, I got to put some funny stuff in it. You know, I, I see what, some things in there. Yeah. I want to see how they, how they do, but Hey, you know, it's because I'm training on my, on how to write evals and the hardest, honestly, the hardest eval you'll ever write is your own eval. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's hard to write. Oh yeah. Good things about yourself. Yeah, it's like, uh, oh man, yeah, I don't feel right writing all this stuff. You know, they're like, wait, what did I do that was good? I remember all the times I told them I did something, but I didn't. Or <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> right? I know I did something that, yeah. Anyway, the uh, sidetrack the whole. Oh uh, no, you're all right, man. That's, that's what this is all about. So. How did you get into uh, the media aspect of uh, uh, taking taking your, what you've done and actually kind of like got to a media presence? Kind of by accident. I, you know, in 2018, um, so my, my buddy Brandon Turner was, uh, I'd met him out in Hawaii. Um, he was looking to move out there. And, and so I'd met him in 2017. And we'd gone hiking once or twice. He was looking to buy a house. I'd been, I knew they were coming back out. So I'd been kind of, looking at houses, showing him things, hadn't really been working out, but he was back out on Oahu while I was stationed there. And so I was like, Hey, you know, you guys should come on base for dinner. We've got a, our base housing is awesome. We've got a great view. We got beach, like I'll, you know, get you on base. It's probably the only chance you'll ever get to see the base because, you know, Marine Corps, they're not gonna let anyone on without me. Um, Cause that base for whatever reason is stricter about that than everywhere else. And so he, they came over for dinner. And I you know, write a book. Uh, Afghanistan, I, don't, I haven't written that one yet. Um, I have a general mission log. And so I was like, you know, it'd be cool to write like the PFC or the Land Corporal Marine Corps version of like Afghanistan from like a, a Pogue, you know, like a, a total um, like motor T guy who didn't do anything cool. Like I'm not a SEAL, not special forces. Like we, we did, we did some cool stuff and we did some stupid stuff and, you know, typical just normal Marine Corps, Afghanistan daily stuff, but no like combat V's and purple hearts and crazy, you know, just normal stuff. But most of those guys don't have like 
journals and mission logs and, and accurate records of everything that happened. So I was like, you know, it'd be cool to be able to do this and just write like the normal dude version of Afghanistan, you know, there's not really a book out there on it. <laughs> and uh, from like a 20 year, 20 year old's perspective. So yeah. I was asking him, like, how do you write a book? And he was like, we should start a blog and just learn how to write, you know, like a thousand words a day, write a blog post. Okay, cool. And I was like, well, what do I write about? Like, I can't just blog about Afghanistan all the time because uh, I'm not there, right? You know, obviously I'm not going to remember any of that. Uh, I can only write so much and then I'm out of content. He's like, just document what you're learning in real estate. Like, talk about like military real estate stuff. There's not a whole lot of people doing that. And there's a lot of people buying houses in the military. And so I just started like, oh, I am buying real estate. I'm learning about it. Every time I learn something, I should write about it. And, you know, some of the first articles are like how to use advanced Google search techniques. I mean, they're not relevant to anything. And then I was like, oh, I'll start a YouTube and a podcast and a, a blog and, a, you know, all these things over the first year or two. I didn't even come up with the name of my website. Someone else did. And uh, then over the first like year, you know, gradually people started to ask questions, you know, Hey, what do you think about this? Or how do I use this? Or can I do this with the VA loan? And as I started hearing the same questions, I would go, Oh, I should write about that. I should learn about this specific thing. Cause I've had the same question seven times. And now I should learn about this, write about that, film a video about that, put that out there. And then I would do that. Then I'd get a different question three or four times and I would do that. And then this, and then now I've learned, oh, hey, well, if I want to reach out to someone who's just joining the military, I can make a video about best MOSs to choose from. And someone might join my audience from that video. Hmm. And, um, you know, so anyway, it just, at some point it just took off. Like I can remember mid 2020, I believe it was, might've even been 2021. It was just like early like between spring and summer, like March, April, my Facebook group was at like 7,000, 8,000 people, which is still a good size. And it'd been growing about a hundred people a week. And one day it just decided that a hundred, a hundred people a week wasn't enough. It was going to go to a hundred a day and then 200 a day and then 300 a day. And it went from 7,000 to like 40,000 in like nine months. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. This is nuts. And then TikTok went from like nothing to 90,000. And then you know, next thing I know, I'm at like 250,000 people across all platforms. And I'm like, oh, ho, ho, what just happened? And it's been kind of like plateaued a little bit and like ups and downs. And, you know, real estate itself is just kind of with interest rates. It's like the the surge kind of, eh, it's not as cool now, but it'll pick yeah. back up again. And, um, but it's, yeah, it's uh, the community has been really cool because it changed from like, I'm just documenting what I'm learning to people are asking questions to I wrote a book about everything I wish I'd known when I joined and I just released a planner on, you know, like my the way I like to journal and uh, like a 90 day planner and uh, people love it, except that I have to announce today that I just realized it's all wrong. Um, so my 90 day planner, right, which should have 12 to 13 weeks of content. Uh, Apparently on the final revision of everything, the PDF that I actually uploaded to Amazon, when I sent it to the lady with 284 pages, I didn't catch that it came back with 244 pages. And so 10 of the weekly planning sections are missing. So my 13 week planner has everything, but only three of the weekly planning sessions instead of 13. And so the first like, however many people ordered in the first three weeks all got a copy that has the full quarterly section, the full monthly section, the full daily section, everything else, and three weeks of the weekly section. So I'm going to have to go and be like, if you ordered one of these things, um, let me know, because within the next month, I'm going to have a whole bunch of boxes of these shipped to my office, and I'm going <laughs> to be ready to ship you fixed ones, and hopefully you guys oh, forgive me. Man. So, oh man, yeah. I, I'm sorry that happened, man. You know, you know, getting ahead of it like you're doing right now. Luckily, you figure that out now. Um, I bet you that you had that little gut wrench, like, oh no, 
Yeah, I realized it when I uh, went to do my fourth week of planning for myself because I had the first copy as the like not for resale test copy from Amazon. Yeah. And I opened it to do the planning for next week and was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Let me go grab the box of all the copies that came from the actual fulfillment center that are sitting in my office. Awesome. And then I'm like, where's the file on my Google Drive? <laughs> and I'm like, son of a gun. Where did it uh, go through all my... Uh, go through everything and i figured out exactly where it happened and i was like oh, oh man. there we are well I, i'm hoping that everybody gets the the fix here soon you already so you already got it all fixed and all that stuff though right the fix is already in works yeah amazon and my other fulfillment company are both in revision it takes two to three days for them to approve the revision so hopefully they stop sending in the meantime but we'll see man and I'm sorry you have to go through that, man. <laughs> it's fun. It's super fun. Oh man. So so one day you just you, you started a blog, you started doing writing, started doing podcasting, and then the next day you were just like, Whoa, why do I have all these people following me all of a sudden? That's that's pretty that's pretty badass, man. And and a lot of people would probably argue that you had a lot of people listening and uh following you because of that consistency that you put into your uh your craft you know and that's kind of like one of the things is like you know i routinely have to not only tell other people but remind myself you want success you have to continuously hammer away at it over and over and over again um it doesn't just come if if you don't you know um when you're framing a house, I'm not sure if you ever, have you had to have you had to do any framing. A little bit. I don't. Yeah. I don't usually do too much hammer swinging. I hire it out. <laughs> not very good at. Oh. So I've learned a lot, man. I've actually done a lot. Like uh, ended up buying an excavator and everything because I was like, oh, what? You're gonna charge me ten grand to dig that? Nope, I'm buying an excavator. <laughs> but it's it's uh you know you don't just uh. You don't just build a wall. Um, just you know, it doesn't just go up. You have to put a bunch of nails. You know, you have to get all your lumber. You have to get everything structurally figured all out, and then you know, then push the wall up. You know, once you get it all built, so it, you have to do a lot of hammering just to get everything put together, or you know, nail gunning, or you know, whatever you're using. But it, you know the point yeah. is it doesn't just happen you gotta you gotta put a lot of extra work in there and a lot of work that people don't see you know so no that's Absolutely. that's awesome man that's awesome so yeah. uh, uh i see you also wrote a book too right that's I, what you were I saying did. i know I, i'm like i should have a copy of it sitting in here but if i was in my office i'd yeah, the, yeah. Um, yeah, the the no BS guide to military life, which is basically just everything I wish I'd known when I first joined the military, right? So that's uh, talks through like the TSP, right? How to use it, how to not be in the G fund, um, the blended retirement system, and the difference, uh, how to get promoted, tips and tricks, uh, MOS, advanced MOS schools. Uh, Things like recruiting duty versus drill instructor, you know, common things people kind of, it's kind of like written in like chronological order, things people kind of go through in their career. Um, and, and, you know, it's in a way that you can totally go, I don't need to read this chapter, skip. Uh, and then like a third of it is real estate, VA loan, different real estate stuff. And then it even talks through like, uh, you know, VA claim briefly uh, transitioning out of the military, uh, you know, how to make that decision about whether or not to exit, because a lot of people, um, you know, kind of as they go through this journey with real estate and stuff that I've noticed come to a fork in the road at some point that I came to, which is, you know, do I want to retire, right? Like, do I continue, right? I, I hit that point at like between the eight to 12 year mark. It was like, hmm, I could continue. I have a successful career. I could also not continue. I'm making moves that would allow me to hang it up and you know how do i weigh the fulfillment of the military and the benefits and the retirement and everything with uh, what i'm doing outside and, and ultimately what i ended up doing was i when i jumped ship at 13 years i, I went in the reserves 
and I did an IMA billet. Uh, so I, you know, 30 days a year instead of every week or one weekend every month. Um, and so theoretically, I mean, technically, I'm still technically in the reserves. I have until the end of March to fulfill 30 days for it to be a good year, uh, except that my reserve unit is just, I don't know what's up with them. They haven't called me. Uh, they haven't responded about when I can drill, haven't shown up since December of 21, and uh, they have just not seemed to care. So it just seems like that's just not meant to be, but it's kind of a bummer because I was more than willing to, you know, actively participate in that. So not really sure what happened there, but oh well, seemed like a good good gig, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so it talks through those options, and then through transition and VA claim and and kind of life after the military, some of those, uh, you know, VGLI and whole life and term life and and kind of sorting all that stuff out as you're transitioning out of the military. Yeah, that's that's a. There's a lot of things that you just covered, like uh, the VA aspect, um, as far as disability, that a lot of us just don't know. Um, I've taken DTAPS class, I've taken uh, TAPS class, I've taken special um, special education on disability, um, and there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff that um, we just don't really know uh, that much about. Like like you need to you need to know this now hey like six month mark when when you're six months from retiring you need to have your va claim essentially all um set up and started and yeah. let's say and you could actually start on some of it like if you know you're you're out like hey the va claim stuff they were saying is good for 12 months so uh, there's there's timelines and stuff like that 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 you need to be aware of um and we just don't really know about it until we go through TAPS class, which is statistically proven that we go we don't go to TAPS class until, at a very minimum, the majority of us are between, um, um, you know, no months left to uh, twelve months left, which is already too late. Um, yeah. And um, that's why I'm creating my other podcast, uh, Return to Roots. Um, which releases February 15th, um, where we address all these things in bucket size portions. And we're going to be talking about the whole entire transition, uh, reintegration, um, and even uh, uh, retention uh, things. Because TAPS used to be a retention tool. Did you attend TAPS before you got out? Yeah, kind of. Um, you talk about you know, getting, doing it all wrong. Uh, here's how, here's how messed up TAPS is. And this isn't even a TAPS issue. This is just a leadership issue. Um, you know, TAPS is mandated, right? At like the highest level, like DOD level mandated before you get out of the military. And, or at least, at least SECNAV level mandated. So and congressional. Oh, there you go. So even higher. And uh, here I am during COVID going through TAPS. And I actually wanted to go. I didn't really know that I'd learn much, but I was like, you know, I, I applied early enough and was like, I want to do this because, you know, I want to see what else I can do. Because in my head, it was like, hey, I'm going to get some extra content that I can write about, if nothing else. Yeah. And I wanted to do the in-person, but they because of COVID, they were doing virtual. My command on day two of TAPS decided that because it was virtual, I could work. I didn't need to be sitting at home because that was clearly me just trying to get out of work. And I was like, uh, nope, this is definitely required. I'm at TAPS. I'm and they're like, it's virtual. I'm like, yeah, it's virtual. I'm at TAPS. I'm not work like I'm I'm not working. And I literally got told because nobody had a backbone that I needed to come into off the office because they thought I was just screwing off. And uh, so I showed up in the office, disgruntled as all get up, especially because I'm in a I work in a skiff, right? Like windowless vault, no cell phone, no whatever. Um, so I show up and I was like, okay, fine, I'll be there tomorrow, but I am in taps, I am TAD, I do not belong to you, I will not do any work. I am not playing the typical Marine Corps. Oh, now that you're on the lunch break, can you? No, 
I am in TAPS class. And I remember we did our morning brief of the GS like 13 or 14 who really didn't ever like me too much because I don't really know. He just never really, he didn't really like too many people, but everybody else just kind of rolled over and took it. And I was like getting out and was like, uh, no, that's, sorry, sir, that's incorrect. Um, you know, whatever. And uh, he came around the corner and he was the one who kind of initiated the whole me coming in the office because it wouldn't be fair for me to be at home doing taps rather than, you know, in a classroom, which I wanted to go in person, but it just wasn't happening. And uh, he comes around the corner and he starts messing with me, you know, starts trying to get me to do work, handing me something. And I just stare at my computer screen with my headphones on, didn't even acknowledge his existence, you know, listen to my class. And he takes my headphones off and I stood up and I looked at him and I was like, you know, anyway, it was like this whole big thing, right? And so they bring me in front of the colonel and like they, they, they try to make a big deal out of it. And so I'm playing along the whole way, right? Being just whatever. And somehow, some way, it made it like two, probably 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It gets up to like the colonel. And so, what seems to be the issue? Like, you know, why is like, because I wasn't going into this brief that they do every morning and I was being this defiant guy who is getting out of the Marine Corps. It was being played out as, you know, staff are on parades, the defiant staff NCO who doesn't want to go in the morning brief because he's getting out of the Marine Corps and he's dropped the pack. And so, you know, you should tell the colonel to his face. And so, I'm like, here's my TID letter, sir. I'm on TAPS right now. And these guys made me come in today because they don't think it's important enough that I do X, Y, Z. And, uh, oh, my goodness, how the tables turned. It was like probably my favorite moment on like my like EAS journey because it was like the colonel was just like, oh, Staff Sergeant, you can take a seat real quick. And it was like, <laughs> whoop. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why, thank you, sir. I'll just buy my own business here while these two fine lieutenant colonel and GS get told how wrong they were. <laughs> like, Oh, it was a mess. So, but it's like, you know, I say, I say that as like this, like jaded story, but it's like, I say it just to be like, that's how messed up the taps process is, is like commands hate it so much. They make it so hard that even if a service member wants to go, it's like, that's how messed up it is. Like, bro, you know, the entire time you're just talking about a minute, my, my blood is just sitting here boiling um because you're right it's it's something that you know no command can prevent a sailor from attending that tabs class and the fact that it was a gs something i hope that guy's listening to the show today because you suck <laughs> 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 like seriously i don't care if you're a gs whatnot like i don't i don't care like you cannot prevent a service member from going to tabs class and in fact uh i hope that person got put on report for that because that's a reportable offense my goodness that is insane wow i'm i'm actually like really mad i'm sound like i'm keeping it pretty cool but i'm actually like bro while no. you're saying that i'm like blood boiling blood boiling yeah i have and, the congressional and the i have the congressional law in front of me i looked it up uh <laughs> I was like, <laughs> the, and the thing that gets me is, you know, I'm a, at the time I'm a 13 year E6 who's had a spotless record. And the only reason I was a 13 year E6 is because I was in the slowest promoting MOS in the Marine Corps. Right. I picked up E7 like two months after I hit the reserves and, uh, you know, so I'm able to stand up for myself, but most of the guys who are getting out of that first term, you know, the reason they hit their taps in the last week or month is because their command is like, no, no, you got to do this. 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 Oh, shoot. We got to get you through this thing at the last minute. And so it's like, man, if you had a command that cared enough to say, hey, you need to go to this a year before, they might actually have a chance at transitioning somewhat smoothly or at least preparing. And man, and, it's a and, mess. And here's the thing, like, Everybody needs to be ready. And whether you're in the military or whether you're working a nine to five job at a bank, you need to be prepared to transition at some point. Some point in time in your life, you're going to transition from what you're doing today into something else. Like you need to prepare for that. And um, I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, what's your plans? I, I'm, I'm the, the one of the senior enlisted leaders that would literally make 
all the sailors write down what their goals were. They would look at me like they were super annoyed and I'd be like, I don't just want your professional goals. I want like your actual goals. Don't BS me and say, I want to make second class. I know you want to make second class. Like, what do you want to, you know, what do you aspire to be? Do you aspire to be a photographer for Vogue? Do you aspire to do this? Like, you know, they're like, why does the senior chief care about that? Because, because you need to know what you want to be eventually in order to start planning for that, the little tiny goals to get to that in, in thing. And that's, you know, and I, I coined uh, navigation charts, you know, and I talk about it in my blog um, where um, navigation charts, you know, you got to have your waypoints in order to get to where you're going. So um, yeah, man. And the, the transition and reintegration uh there's so many there's so many resources out there for veterans, and I'm hoping my podcast that I release here, it's called Return to Roots, will actually help people uh, figure that stuff out, man. And uh, yeah, just kind of getting back onto the chart your fi stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, so writing a book, man, was that like your your end goal or what's your what's your actual end goal because because it sounds like you still owe us a book about your perspective in afghanistan yeah i know that got pushed back again right so i, I ended up making the planner which uh came about uh at, at kind of out of nowhere i was had a planner i was using and it got back order on back order for like six months so i bought another one and i was like oh i really like some stuff on this but i really dislike some other stuff so i tried a third one well, the first one was still on back order. And I was like, Ooh, I like some other stuff. And I just like some other So I was like, I'm going to take all three of these and set them down and write out what I like and dislike about all three and piece it all together. And I just stacked it out into like on paper, like hand wrote like 20 pages of like, this is what I like about all these. And then I designed it in Canva and then I sent it to a designer and built it all out for myself. I was like, I'm going to just build my own journal for me of all the things I like from all three of these. That way it will never be on back order. I will have my own. I'll just be able to print it, send it to myself. And, uh, I shared it with a buddy and he was like, I want one. I shared it with another buddy. It's like, I want one. Share it with a couple other buddies. They made a couple different changes and they were like, I want one. Can I have one? What if you tweak this? I want this. Add some, add some space for notes and I want one. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, I need to just make this for everyone. So that became a book. And then that just released totally wrong, but it'll release again. Uh, and then um, <laughs> I'm in the middle of another one. So I'm going to release two, hopefully this year, once I can get my schedule back to where I can write again. Um, guide to passive investing and active investing. So I'm trying to write like just not on a specific subject, but like just – you know, passive investing will be like syndications, index funds, REITs, just passive, more passive types of investment for the person who has money, but no time. And then active for the person who has time, but no money. And it'll be, you know, options trading, stocks, flipping houses, wholesaling, you know, and, and so they'll hopefully go like hand in hand to help people determine investment strategies that fit where they are in life uh, in all different types of niche. So those are proving to be a little bit more complex, but, uh, I'm just going like wave tops on different strategies, but there are strategies in there that I want to talk about that I don't know much about. So I'm having to like research and, and network and like, Hey, can you come write a piece of this? Cause I want to wave top on options trading. And while I understand the concept, I cannot wave top accurately. Uh, so help me build this out. Um, so, you know, but it should be, it should be fun. Um, after that, I think the Afghanistan book will eventually make, make yeah. it around if I'm, you know, still yeah. here. Uh, so I could, I could totally, um, I could totally do one as well. And like you, you said that and I'm like, man, there's so many, like, yeah, I wasn't a, you know, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not recon out there or, uh, you yeah. know, the traffic controller, uh, you know, what do they do? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, air com air track or uh, yeah. uh, combat controllers. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, you know, I I I don't do none of that. But like, I I spent two tours in Afghanistan. Yeah, like, it'd be kind of cool to kind of document that. I never even thought about doing that, but I have thought about writing a book myself. And 
Uh, I'm starting with documenting everything in my life, going, going way back to like in the beginning. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> there you go. It's like uh, just to kind of better analyze what what my actual reality is in some things, because you know, hey, you're dealing with your own PTSD. Sometimes you have to you have to go back and look at your own realities because we all have different it's funny how your perspective on something can change if you just go through and analyze it yeah absolutely so yeah well yeah man like and then that's that's uh that's something man you've done something that i really want to do and that's like honestly like get into writing the book and man that that would that's awesome that you've done that not only once but you know uh, a couple times and you're working on your third and fourth one then that's it's epic yeah well when you get when you get ready you let me know i gotta i'll introduce you to my publishing coach she's awesome nice yeah i can use all no. the help i can get <laughs> can't we all <laughs> and keep in mind i failed an english class in high school so anybody can write a book hey man i graduated high school with a 1.8 that's yeah that all right you got me beat <laughs> i wasn't much i wasn't much better though i mean it's there's a two in there so yeah yeah i oh man like high school was just it was so bad for uh, I, um that's why overcoming odds you know hey if you were to look at me go snap back where i was at if you were to look at me at that age time frame you would have been like wow man military was like your only option in some ways it really was it was like my one yeah. saving grace. And um, that's why I'm so thankful for um, the service that I've been able to uh, um, uh, provide, you know, service the nation. And then it really helped me grow into the person I am. So, you know, hey, you're not going to get rich out of the military. But if you can make some somewhat uh, good, good, uh, good moves early on in your um career you know you're gonna be fine oh man that just actually reminds me did you see you listen to jock stuff at all sometimes not not as much as i probably should well he it just popped up on my feed and he released this quick video about thinking strategically i'm like bro that is that's actually like exactly it you know strategic thought the military was a was a strategic thought in a time when I wasn't being very successful with anything. You know, I knew that hey, yeah. if I stuck it out, I could retire when I was 38. That was a strategic thought. The only unfortunate thing is he's like, there's strategic thinking, then there's tactical thinking. A lot of us think just tactically in the moment. Drinking, going out and partying, spending money on dates, cars you know all all the fun stuff you know a lot of us don't think uh long term until it's like a little, a little too late so um he he hit that one right on the right on the head about about that you know having a having a little um, um delayed gratification on things yeah i yeah i agree delayed gratification is the way to go for sure yeah, that marshmallow theory. <laughs> Have you ever seen that study? Yeah, man, you, you should you should say it because there's gonna be people. Uh, oh have... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for anyone who hasn't heard, and I don't know where I can't remember where the study was done, but um, basically they did a study where they set a bunch of kids in different rooms, and they uh, they set one marshmallow in front of all the kids, and they said, "Hey, uh, we'll be back in five minutes. If you eat your marshmallow, great. If you don't eat your marshmallow, we'll give you another one." And the kids who ate the marshmallow, whatever, and the kids who did not eat the marshmallow got a second one. So you either got one marshmallow or you waited five minutes, you got two marshmallows. And what they did then was they followed those kids like all the way through their adult lives. And they found that the kids who had been able to wait the five minutes for the second marshmallow and therefore, you know, were able to show that they could wait for delayed gratification. Uh, were in m almost every metric that they were, you know, testing for through this study, more successful in life throughout their years, right? And uh, it's a pretty cool study. It's worth worth checking out. It's very interesting. 
So I, I think, yeah, uh, delayed gratification, right? The ability to say, yeah, I'll, I'll wait, right? Instead of having, you know, in, in the simplest way that you could look at this right now is that piece of cheesecake feels good right now, but the beach body will feel a lot better at summer. I don't know, man. I like things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I got the dad bod, the bearded dad bod. Yeah. Yeah, I got the dad bod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, hey, um, I'm going to go ahead and just go to the final questions, man. Um, Sounds good. Uh, so, first final question is, is what book do you recommend people to read? Mm. You know, there's, there's a lot of great books out there, but one that I've always liked for service members is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, and I like it because uh, it does a really good job of helping you understand how to be efficient uh, You know, in W-2s or hourly jobs, and especially in the military. You know, a lot of people get wrapped up in working, you know, how do I get do the least amount of work in the required amount of time that I'm supposed to be here. And if you want to get into, you know, working for yourself or financial freedom or entrepreneurship or any of that, you've really got to figure out how to be, you know, how do I get the most done in the least amount of time? And so that book will really start to kind of flip some of those things on end and it's a good read. Um, yeah, I, I've read that book, man. It's actually like really insightful. Um, the uh, other question I'm going to ask is, if you were to flash back to 18-year-old Dave, what would you tell tell yourself? Mm. Don't put your money in the G fund. Now, uh, <laughs> man, I mean, if I could tell myself anything, I would I would just say contribute. You know, not even not save more, but just contribute more to interest-bearing accounts, right? You know, uh, whether that's index fund or uh houses or whatever just invest more at an early age every dollar you invest at 18 is worth you know double what it is at 28 and quadruple what it is at 38 and you know it's the later you start the harder it is and so take those risks and even if you don't really know what you're doing just start investing at 18. nice man that's that's pretty solid new uh pretty solid um advice right there. And uh I like the the first initial thought, don't put it in G fun. <laughs> yep. It's like I want to go back and just slap myself for not going wake up during this uh TSP brief during boot camp. Wake up. Like, hey, pay attention no. to this. one thing. Pay attention to your TSP. <laughs> I know. I wish someone had done what I was doing at my last unit. At my last unit, when we had a Marine show up, I'd be like, all right, open your TSP. And they'd log in. I'd be like, log into your TSP, go to your dashboard. They'd go in. Great. Go to your funds. Here's where your money's going. All right, you're in traditional. You're in this contribution. And I, and I wouldn't tell them where to put it, but I would explain. Like, this is what traditional is. This is what Roth is. Here's the difference. Do you think, like, and I would explain, like, when it makes sense to move where and i would let them come to their own decision yes obviously i would probably try to coach them towards which decision makes sense for them which by the way for basically every service member and their mother unless they plan on earning millions as a service member and nothing outside of the military roth is the way to go but um you know your matching contribution will always go traditional but you know i'd, I'd inch them towards roth and i would say hey not the g fund like life cycle or read this book simple path to wealth by jl collins and then you'll probably come up with an allocation that looks like this or here's a blog post that's really good about it but you've got to decide the allocation yourself i'm not going to tell you but here's some options um but at least explain it so they had something yeah but i wish you had done that to me i was uh i would always show them my excel spreadsheets because i love Ooh, love Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> nerd. Uh, yeah, I am. I am that nerd. But I would literally show them <laughs> like, "Hey, this is Airman Timmy, and this is Airman, uh, and this is Airman Billy Bob, and Billy Bob did this, and Timmy did this, 
which one do you want to be? And they're like, I want to be Airman Timmy. I'm like, ding, ding, ding. Airman Timmy put it in to this fund. And they're like, whoa. And I'm like, yeah, go look at tsp.gov, open it up. There you go. And I would just show them the numbers and how they were like, how does it do that? And I'm like, compound interest is compound interest is the most amazing thing ever. So yep. Um, and last question. How do people get a hold of you or find you? Yeah, at, at this point, oh, you know what? I'm totally going to just try this out. Yeah. I haven't done this yet. Text FMTM, which is Fight <clears throat> Fox Mike Tango Mike to 88500. So FMTM to 88500. I haven't used that yet, but that's my new contact card. So if you text that, it'll yeah. drop everything to you. Now, if you don't want to do that, uh, then you can just go to basically Google Military Millionaire or From Military to Millionaire. And on any of your favorite platforms, I will show up as one of those things. Nice, man. Well, hey, um, I appreciate you coming on here and uh, recording with uh, Chart Your Fi. Do you have any uh, save rounds or alibis? No, sir. I appreciate you. It's been a good time. Yeah, man. So, so everybody out there that's listening, hey, now everything's uh, rainbows and unicorns, so you guys have a good one. I got a saved round and alibi here. It is, again, Return to Roots. It is releasing February 15th, 2023. It will be on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other social media websites. Please get out there. Listen to it. It can help people in the long run. Our goal is to reduce homelessness and also suicides within the community. We are going to be talking about retention in the military. We're going to be talking about transition from the military and reintegration into the community. This podcast is not just for the service members, but also for the family unit dependents. Anybody that wants to help or say thank you for your service and put it to action, listen to the podcast. It will help you find ways to do so. You guys have a great day. Try Your Fire is not affiliate and does not represent the views of the Department of Defense and or the Department of the Navy. All views are that of the host and the guests that are brought on to the show. This information is meant to be in general, so do your own research before you implement. This is not financial advice and is meant for educational purposes. If you need financial advice, look it up on Mass Chief Google or hire a reputable financial advisor. Alone, we are weak. Together, we are strong. In unity, there is strength.